All right, we're just going to get started. But please do come on over if you feel like you're lacking some knowledge in the world. We've got some right here. We're going to have a talk. It's going to be super interesting. And believe me, you want to be here. Uh, so the next speaker on our creativity stage is uh, somebody who's been working on the national birthday calendar. Uh, he scraped uh, lots of data from different website and put the, put websites and put them all into one calendar of the nation. Uh, and he's going to tell us a little bit about uh, how big, big data is going to change the world and how it might make it a little bit more difficult for us to let go as humans. Please give a very warm applause for Simon Schep. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks. Yeah, so I would like to talk to you about letting go and how in a world of big data, it might become more difficult to do just that. Um, but I want to start with the question that you as a, a mostly student audience will probably understand, which is um, letting go. How fun is that? Like, can you remember the last time you really let go? You really went crazy, you did something naughty, maybe you, you know, did some drugs, I don't know, but you, you did something that probably wasn't, you know, that you were breaking your own rules. And while you were doing that, you might also have been breaking society's rules, right? It's, 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 as a student, it's a time when you explore this stuff. And what we see happening, though, is something I find interesting is, I, I read this in the New York Times. It's a student called Mia, and she says, well, we are getting more reserved. She's going to parties, and she doesn't get as drunk as she used to. And um, it's because she says, well, I don't want to have to defend myself later, so you don't do it. So she is afraid that she'll get on Facebook, on Instagram, that her friends will take pictures of her and share her, her you know, dubious deeds and her wildness with the rest of the world. So she's starting to worry a little bit. She, there's a, a, a thought in the back of her mind going, should I do this? And I think this is what's happening to all of us in a larger sense. And I think it's a, a bit more subtle than that example. And I think it has to do with big data and how that's becoming more and more a thing that's, that's influencing the way that we, we live. And it starts with this idea that, that not only do you have you know, friends who take, pay, take pictures of you and put them on Facebook, but increasingly uh, pictures of us are made by big services and companies that every time that you click this agree button, in a way you could say you're also clicking a, a, a record button where people start recording your life and creating pictures of you. Um, and I think this guy made it really abundantly clear that, that there are some, are some downsides to that, that these, th this data has been gathered on a larger scale than we ever thought possible, and that might have some uh, consequences for our society. And he's really made it a lot easier as well for the organization where I work, which is called Setup, to talk about these issues of, of what this data is doing with us. And we try to make people understand technological issues in a fun way, because I think, I think when we look at the world, we see a lot of times that people don't really care so much about technology. It's difficult and it's complex and we don't really want to engage with it, but I think it's really important that we do. And I'll give you an example of how we do that. We do fun projects like Everyone is a Spy. And Everyone is a Spy was a media campaign in which we um, created uh, a, a campaign that went all over Holland. So this was some um, video work by Jeffrey Lillemon and Thomas Hoogeling. And it was all over uh, like screens in the Netherlands and it basically showed this idea that no longer is a security camera the thing that controls us, but we ourselves are becoming each other's surveillors. We are they're spying on each other. Another example is this work by um, Ruben Pater and Hans Zwart. And uh, they created a set of posters that kind of make this the idea that social media might have a darker side to it, right? And you can see in this like, do I want to be followed on Twitter all the time? It might have a, a downside. And these again were placed all over the Netherlands and uh, to kind of give this, I spread this idea that this, there's something going on there. But the thing that got the most attention in our media campaign was this website called Copy Copy. It is basically a, a, a shop that sells coffee mugs, but the makers of this project, um, um, Yuri Veerman and Dimitri Dokmetsis, they took pictures from social uh, photo sharing site Flickr. So they took pictures of children that people had uploaded themselves. They looked for pictures like daughter or son and then they took the pictures and put them on mugs because oddly enough they were allowed to do that a lot of times people give licenses that allow commercial reuse of their work when they share it on Flickr so they did that so they made this web shop and they said well here we have some mugs that is someone's favorite child on your favorite mug and of course this thing went crazy because all the parents wanted to know if their kids faces were being sold on our mug 
Uh, and that even reached CNN. Right? So this is all a way of, of, of sharing this idea that we might be oversharing, that we're sharing too much, and that we are um, l you know, helping organizations like the NSA or other organizations do their work by, by doing their work for them. Again, this is a, a concept that we're trying to explain. We know this idea of surveillance where we're being watched from above, but we also have this idea called surveillance, which is when we look back at the watchers, like when you record a cough. Right, so the smartphone is the perfect surveillance device. And, and, but we now have all this, so this layer of covalence, where we're also looking at each other. And I think the Google Glass is the ultimate covalence device, where you just start recording each other without really knowing when. And it's something that we wanted to explain. But like I said, I'm here really today to talk about our latest project, which is called uh, the National Birthday Calendar. And it's a project in which we really try to get to know Dutch people. Because as you know, Dutch people, we like to bike. I'm sure you know that, but we also really like to party. We party our asses off. Um, and this is what a typical Dutch party looks like. You know, this is someone's get 50th birthday. This is someone's getting six years old. So, you know, people have practiced partying. They're pretty good at that. Of course, the national birthday calendar is, uh, in its essence, a database of all these Dutch people. What we tried to do was uh, gather as much data online as we could find and bring it all together and find out everyone's name and address and date of birth and whatever they're into. And the idea is that we could then give everyone intimate gift suggestions. Because if we know everything about you, we can tell all your friends what you would like to have for your birthday. You will never get any more unwanted birthday presents. Wouldn't that be great? That would be awesome. So this was the idea. So we will finally be able to find out, you know, who likes soap. I, I know there are, might be people who actually like that as a birthday present. I hear they exist. Um, or you might like a nice um, necklace. So what we did, we got together with a lot of, of, of hackers and data experts and other enthusiasts. And we basically had this so thinking about, like, what can we get? So you see a whole wall here full of sources that we thought, well, if we get that data, then we could, let's, let's try it. How far can we get? So these are examples of the data sources that we got, like Hives and Scrollbank, and, and it's like a, a school website. Um, uh, the phone book, uh, things like eBay, the Dutch eBay, all kinds of websites that people are a member of and where they share basically, again, way too much about their lives. Um, and basically you could say it was a puzzle with 16 million pieces because there are 16 million people living in Holland. So over the course of six Saturdays with 35 hackers and a lot of volunteers, we were able to create this, this, this data set. And we found some interesting things like uh, this is our minister of... Uh, well, education and technology, uh, Ronald Plasterk, he's in there. And in the end, we found, well, we have 8 million data on 8 million people in the Netherlands, but we have really good data on about 800,000 of them now. So 800,000 of them, we know the name, date of birth, address, and something else, like something that they're interested in or some other fact. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, c quite a bit. Uh, we were surprised that in six weekends we could get this. If we can get this in six weekends, what does... What do other organizations have? What do hackers have? What is crazy? So I think this is relevant because you see this, this, this data world is becoming very important. Profiling is becoming a huge market, knowing a lot about you. So you see, who here has heard of Palantir? Two people. So Palantir is, is a company I think we should all know because at the current stock valuation, at the current stock market, it's bigger than Twitter. It helps organizations like uh, the governments and companies to make sense of their data and makes the pictures understandable and, and, uh, and, and yeah, usable. And yeah, they're a $20 billion company right now. And you've never heard of them, but what they basically do is, is, is what we are doing, gathering data and making it understandable. So they're one big party in this whole field of data brokers. These are companies that gather data and share it uh, for a price, of course. And they offer data enrichment services. So if you, for instance, give them an email, they will give you the uh, accompanying name or a phone number or whatever you're interested in. And the fun thing is, this is also trickling down to all of us. So I don't know if any of you have heard of Crystal Nose, but Crystal Nose is a very funny website you can sign up for right now. I can recommend you try it. Crystalnose.com. Uh, it looks like this, and it basically it's a service that will help you send emails to people and make those emails convincing. And it does this by looking at whatever we post online. They have a database of a lot of people, of all of us, as, as far as I can tell. Um, 
And then it will look at whatever you post and then use a psychological algorithm that looks at the words that you use to kind of figure out what kind of person you are, what kind of character you have. And then it tries to give uh, yeah, some insight into that and then give some insight in how you should optimally send an email to you, uh, to, get, you know, to get you to do what they want or other way around. I think this is a really interesting uh, yeah, service that, that for me foreshadows a lot more uh, of this to come. So what all these companies will tell you is that data as a new gold. Oh. Right. Sorry about that. Right, so what all these companies will tell you is that data is a new gold. And I'm here to argue that it might be gold for them, but it might not be gold for you, right, for as a citizen. And that has to do with this, this word, behavior. This is what so much is, uh, is about right now, is the idea that data can change behavior. That if we know you well enough, we can use the data to change your behavior. And let, let's look at some examples here, right here in the EU. In Holland right now, there was a, a discussion where uh, there are uh, insurance companies that would like to offer you a lower price insurance if you allow a GPS tracker in your car. So you give them data and then they give you a discount. Um, and the idea is of course that when you have that tracker in your car, when you know you're being followed, that you might drive a little bit more safely, right? You start thinking, well, this insurance company is looking over my shoulder, maybe I should behave better. We also see the rise of applicant tracking systems so if you apply for a job at a big company like Shell or, or KLM or whatever, um, there are so many applicants that they will have an algorithm that will look at your uh, resume and your letter to kind of filter out the, the best ones before any human, any human looks at it. So again, you see this rise of, of uh, uh, these systems and these algorithms that will uh, try to understand your profile and your, your behavior and your, your personality. Another interesting case last year was uh, people. People was a website that was basically uh, like a rating system like you have for cars or for washing machines or any other product that you buy, but for people. So you could rate people around you and give them like a five star rating or a one star rating. And it, it became a huge thing, but it's, it's an example I think of this world where we're starting to get everyone's information and, and look at that better. So you see that these systems are very powerful and they're not very transparent. That of course meant that China got interested and uh, China is now building something called a social credit system. Basically, it's a, a score that reflects how good of a citizen you are. Like if you're a good citizen, you get a higher score. If you have a bad score, you're probably a, a bad citizen. Um, and this is their, their thinking behind it. They say when people's behavior isn't bound by their morality, a system must be built to uh, restrict their actions. So they don't really trust their citizens to do the right thing. They kind of want to push you change your behavior to do the right thing. And they say the system will be uh, based on various criteria, ranging from financial credibility and criminal record to social media behavior. From 2020 onwards, each adult citizen should, besides his identity card, have such, such a credit code. So they're making this mandatory, right? Everyone in China by 2020 will get this score that represents how good of a citizen you are. But they're not really wasting any time. Already uh, things like, are you buying the right things? Are you saying the right things and doing the right things start to matter because they're already building Sesame Credit. Sesame Credit is this, basically a, 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 an early version, a beta, an alpha version of the same system where the things that you buy in Alibaba and other websites turns into a score. And it's already connected to uh, the largest dating website in China. So you can already kind of tell if the person that you want to date you know, buys the right things, is a good citizen, these things are really important to people in China. And this is starting to go in this direction. Like getting a loan or getting a visa or getting a, a government job will be increasingly dictated by the score that you have. So if you have a high score, it's easier to get a, a visa. But if you have a low score, it might be difficult to leave the country. Now, you could be saying, well, that's your own responsibility. You know, if these systems happen, happen if you do the right things, if you're a good citizen, then you really don't have, no, don't have a problem, nothing to hide, etc. But the thing is, this is also happening in China. Your friend's score influences your score. So even if you're the perfect citizen, if you have a friend that has a low score, that might drag you down, right? So you start thinking, 
why am I still friends with this person? Because they're dragging me down, and I really want to go on a trip to Europe. So what I think we see is the rise of something called data discrimination, where these data systems are, are trying to influence our lives and might not, uh, well, not judge us fairly or influence our behavior in certain ways that are not really, I think, optimal or honest. You see some kind of digital-born inequality that these systems that promise to set us free are in a way, uh, you know, strengthening this, this other side of, of our society as well. And of course, Sesame Credit will not divulge exactly how it calculates its credit scores, explaining that it's a complex algorithm. Right, so again, you see this, this hiddenness, this untransparency of the whole, the whole system and the whole situation. So what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say that data is not neutral. Right, data is always defined, and what is good is always defined by someone who's building the application. Like the Chinese government is deciding what is a good citizen and how the algorithms should reflect that. So what, is, what should you buy to be a good citizen? Maybe you should buy more rice, but if you buy games, then maybe you're not a good citizen. Who knows? But it's not neutral, that's for sure. I also want to say that data is not the new gold, right? I think that, that I hope that this shows that data is not the new gold, because with gold, we only think it's positive and great, and that's a dangerous metaphor to use. If we're going to use a metaphor, maybe we should use oil. Because right, with oil, over the past 50 years, we've learned that there are great sides to it. We can do a lot of things with it, make medicine, but there are also really serious downsides. And only now, after all these years and all these decades, are we starting to really deal with those issues and really understand them. Right? But it took a long time, and I hope that we won't make the same problem with the same mistake with big data. I think what we're seeing is that with big data, we are kind of destroying our social ecosystem. Right? We are, we are using it in a way that is destroying our social relationships or, or influencing them in a way that I, w I would say is not really helpful or not really environmentally friendly. So when we see how oil is creating global warming, I worry that big data might create social cooling, where we all start to, start to behave better, maybe, in a way. Now, you think, okay, so this is China, that's, that's interesting, but, you know, that's not happening here. But I want to show you one, one more startup that I think is relevant. This is Deemly. This is a startup that basically also wants to give you one score that kind of reflects all your other reputation scores that you have online. And this is their Meet promo. Shelley. She's a keen traveler, often renting apartments from others, and she loves to swap trendy clothes and dresses. She's looking to catch her first lift from a rideshare app, but has no previous reviews to help support her. Aww. Luckily, she's just joined Deemly where her positive feedback from the other sites appears as a Deem score, helping her to win a rideshare in no time. Deemly is free to join and supports users across many platforms, helping you to share and benefit from the great reputation you've earned. Imagine the power of using your Deem score alongside your CV for a job application, perhaps to help get a bank loan, or even to link to from your dating profile. Sign up now at deemly.co. Deemly, better your sharing. So those examples were pretty much exactly what China is doing, right? Get co connecting it to dating websites, connecting it to jobs, connecting it to getting a loan. So we see the same thing happening here. I think what's interesting here is that I think China is in a way, uh, or could be, could be the new Russia. I think for a long time during the Cold War, in America, people really remembered what it was to be free and how important it was to be free because there was a, this anti-thesis. Like, we don't want to be Russia because in Russia you're not free. In America, you're free. I think China could be the same thing in, in a big data world where we look at China and say, well, we don't want that. Right? We don't want this repression. We, we don't want to use this technology for repression. So maybe we should not uh, create all these database systems that create reputation systems that really go this far and that might have a, um, a limiting effect on us. Because whatever you say, I think mean, China is at least honest, honest about what they're doing. They're totally open about it. They're saying we're using these data systems to repress people. We are mostly just unaware, I think, of what we're doing. And I think we have to become more aware. I think that's w one thing that I would like to ask you, of all of you as students, become more aware of these issues that are also part of big data. So having done this stuff for three years, what have I learned? I think one thing I've learned is that you do have something to hide, right? But it's not about being a terrorist or something like that. It's about, you know, uh, getting uh, uh, chances in your life, about the chance that you will get to get a good job, meeting nice people, all these type of small things, right? So this is what privacy is also about, having those chances given to you and not having some system um, 
take those away or, or, or push them to the side a little bit. And I think also that what I've learned is that privacy is the right to be imperfect. When you look at these systems and how they are kind of nudging you towards a certain behavior, trying to make you a better citizen or a better um, consumer, I think you see that there's a really important that we can have the right to not become the best citizen or not be the perfect consumer. I think privacy is what, what, what does that. So for me, coming back to the theme of this talk, for me, privacy is the right to let go, right? The right to be human and let go once in a while and not worry about it ending up in a database or in some kind of sensor or network or whatever. But, you know, I think that's important. I think we have to fight to be able to keep breaking our own rules, right? To not create these, these data nets, but, ex 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 uh, yeah, escape that. Because otherwise you might end up with a society where we're all more well-behaved, but maybe also less human. Thank you. Thank you, Diamond. Uh, is it okay with you if I ask you a couple more questions? Yeah, go for it. I was wondering, I was looking at your talk, and I was wondering, um, you talked about uh, China being the new Russia because it's unfree, because uh, they use big data against their citizens. Yep. Um, how bad do you feel it is in the West? Uh, well, I think it's pretty bad. Uh, I think we're, because we're so naive about it. I think we are already building loads and loads of data systems and gathering uh, loads and loads of data without really thinking through the ethical and political implications of it. Like when you look at the smart city, like just put sensors and everything, gather data everywhere, and everyone's like, great idea. And, and no one really stops to think, well, are there downsides to this? Should we do this? I think there are serious consequences to, to taking this, these systems that are on the internet and then putting them in our cities. Like again, we'll also get the control that is you know, available on the internet. We'll, we're now putting that in our cities. I don't think that's a smart idea at all. For me, that's not a smart city. Well, it makes somebody smarter, but, m but maybe not us. Is that the thing? That, that could be it, yeah. That's it, probably. Again, right? it's about power and, and politics. Yeah, and so who gets the power and yeah. s stuff like that. So why do you think it is that uh, Westerners or Dutch people are so naive about all the implications of this new technology? I think um, uh, it's just all too shiny. Technology is so shiny and interesting, and I think what I see is, is what, what philosophers call technological determinism. I see the idea that we see technology as this thing that will change our world. It's something that we can't stop. It's just this force that is washing over our society and we can't stop it. And, and we, we regurgitate that belief. We tell each other that, that it's, oh, it just, you know, you can't stop technology. Yeah, and that's and also being often said by media, right? That it's yeah. inevitable or yeah. like... But it's not. It's not inevitable. We all can decide how how we want to change society and how we change technology. That's what we've been doing since forever. Like, we've stopped nuclear power, for example, because we thought, well, you know, it might not be the best technology ever, right? So we, now we, 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 didn't, we didn't use that for, for ages. As best all kinds of examples like that. As best as loads of examples where it's not just because it's so obviously evil, but also things that are, are like in the middle, and we're like, nah, let's not do that. We, we have that choice, and I think we have to become a lot better at, at regulating these, these systems and protecting our privacy and all these things to avoid the downsides. So say uh, people here go home tonight and think, yeah, you know, maybe it can be used against me one day and I'm not really up for that. Uh, what, can, what can the average person do by himself, the average citizen? Yeah, that's a very really difficult question because um, we all, of course, should learn more about it and care about it. I think that's, that's a big step, but it's, it's like global warming, I think the metaphor is, 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 is good because it, global warming is also something that we, we can be a part of the solution, but it's a bigger problem as well. Like we have to change it at you know, all, all kinds of levels, also on the government level um, and uh, corporate level, all kinds of levels, all kinds of people have to care and understand the issue and then we can change it. But uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, where to start? Yeah, start by becoming a member of Bits of Freedom or some kind of local digital rights group start installing uh, privacy uh, things in your browser, etc. Become aware. Vote Pirate Party, just saying. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Diamond, uh, give him a warm applause, please. Oh, there's a question. Huh? There's a question. Oh, there's a question. Great. Perfect. <laughs> Hi. Um, well, actually, maybe I'd, I'd like to challenge you a little bit on this idea. I think that please do. societies throughout history have always had this kind of obsession with control and in some ways we went from city-states to countries and 
control always gets sort of larger and more heavy if you look out through history. But I think that in a way, being controlled also maybe makes societies better. So could we also make the case that taken to an extreme it gets worse, but that gradual increases in control, like how China is doing things, for example, actually could make society and humans better by shielding them a bit or making their not so great sides sometimes a little bit more inhibited and that actually there is also a positive case to be made for you know taking steps towards gradually being more controlled in this not so evil kind of social way that China is doing for example yeah um, I think it's always a balance between you know controlling people and, and giving them freedom and that we've always decided on that but I do think there's something different about this that we're mostly not seeing which is that these systems are very subtle right and they're not so much about like like if a police officer says hey don't cut down a tree here you, know, you understand that and that's a crime and, and we've decided that together that that's a bad thing what i think is happening here is that we don't really see how these systems are influencing us we're not really regulating it and we don't really have uh, a detailed understanding of how it's repressing it i think also it's 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 going beyond you know um making people not do bad things. I think it's also starting to stop people from doing good things, like being themselves and having fun. And, and I think that's what I want to uh, point us to and be become aware of that. I think we might have tried that whole uh, fascism thing uh, a little while back, but that didn't work out too well. <laughs> well uh, let me give another example. What I worry about is that this will... Um, hamper creativity, that we might become less creative because of this, because we're all regressing to a norm, all you know, being afraid of being different, like artists are, for example. And I find it very ir ironic that a society that's like Holland, which says, oh, we want to be a creative nation, and it's important, and we want to have startups and creative, 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 and at the same time, those startups are building systems that might, in the long run, make us less creative. I think that's something that we have to point out, and uh, that you know, is important to, to look at. I'm kind of a big fan of corporate dictatorship, you might say. I know it's not a popular thing to say. And, of course, when I say corporate dictatorship, I don't mean like a totalitarian. You involve people, but there's still one person who makes the choices, which makes you fast, which makes you able to adapt or sometimes take chances. And I think that's something that we sometimes have a bit trouble talking about the fact that that can be a very powerful thing also, to have someone who's really strongly in control and can make the tough choices, whether you like him or not sometimes, because sometimes we need that. I'm you know what I mean? I'm, yeah, I'm not sure what, uh, what, what point of my talk this refers to, to be honest. Um, I don't have any problem with Steve Jobs' leadership style. I don't think, I don't see the connection, but... Um, I guess there's a little bit of a difference between uh, in, a, in a company or uh, a government. Yeah. That's, that's a bit of a difference, of course. To some, to some degree, yeah. yeah. I think when I look at the startup scene, to be honest, I see a lot of times um, this type of leadership also leads to blatant breaking of, of rules and regulations and, and societal uh, things that we agreed on, but maybe not have written down. But um, like when I look at Uber, for example, you know, the screw it, we're going to build taxis everywhere and, uh, you know, innovate first, ask questions later. I think that mentality is also part of the problem, uh, oftentimes. Any other questions? All right. You sure? All right, we're done. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today. Yeah. Thank you, Time and Schrepp. And uh, we'll be back at uh, 6 o'clock right here on the stage with uh, the world's best job. Please come back. See ya. <laughs>